Well, what a very different Easter it is for us this year. I trust that you're coping with the isolation, but one key thing to remember is that we are never isolated from God's love because we can never be separated from God's love for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're no closer to God than when we open his word and read it and reflect on it together because God is present to us through his word. So I hope that in these next few minutes, I can encourage you and strengthen your grip on the hope that we have in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's where we're heading this morning. I want you to be sure that Jesus' death and resurrection is not made up, is no mistake, and that we have nowhere else to turn. First of all, it's not made up. Are we being sane and sensible in continuing to believe that Jesus died and rose again, claiming it to be a true event? Friends, the Bible itself says that, look, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christians are more to be pitied than any other people. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our whole understanding of who Jesus is is shot. We've been completely sucked into a lie, says the Bible itself. Uh, we're living life based on nothing more than a fairy tale. We have no hope for the present and nothing to look forward to in the future. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, more fool us. Plenty of skeptics say that the Christian story is just a myth and that we should embrace it as a myth and not to confuse it by trying to say it actually happened. Every culture has its myths, says the skeptics, which drive and empower them. And this is our myth. And whether it's history or not is irrelevant. But friends, look, if it's just a myth to keep our hopes up, let's say at times such as this in the coronavirus and pandemic, if it's just a story to keep our hopes up, then frankly, I don't want to know about it. It has all the impact of reading Cinderella to your children or grandchildren. A lovely fairy tale, but it's not going to sustain you for life. So let me say as clearly as I can that there are implications in this text from Matthew 28 and from the other Gospels that it is not made up. Why do I say that? Because it's women who are first reported to see the empty tomb and to come across Jesus himself. If you were making this up, there is no way in the world that you would have as your key witnesses, first to the empty tomb, then to the messengers, then to Jesus himself as women. Now, it saddens me to say but a, women's, a woman's testimony was worth nothing in the ancient world. Fortunately, that's not the case now. But in the ancient world of the first century, a woman's evidence would not, was not admissible in court. It wasn't reckoned reliable. So let's be clear, if you were making this up, if you were fabricating a myth, there is no way that you would have women as the first people to see the empty tomb or Jesus. Okay, so how do we know that the writers weren't just so clever in the way that they put the account together that it has a ring of reality to it? Tony Morfett. A writer of some many episodes of Australian soaps and, and, and dramas, he says, I have written fiction and have written facts. There is a distinctly different style to both. This has the distinctive features of fact, not fiction, he said. Charles Colson of the Watergate scandal, he says, The whole success of Watergate revolved around everybody in the process sticking to the same story. Well, they didn't. Within 48 hours, it all fell apart. Charles Colson goes on to say, how do you expect that 12 disciples, <laughs> shattered because their leader had been taken, broken men, men who had locked themselves away because they thought they were going to be arrested and killed next, how do you expect that they rallied and became strong men of leadership and vision and put their lives on the, on the line and preached and wrote and were martyred all for the sake of a fabricated myth. How did 12 men maintain the con story for so long, even to the point of death? Friends, Jesus' death and resurrection is not made up. I want you to be absolutely certain of that this Easter. It happened. 
this account is true and Jesus is alive. And my salvation is not an imaginary salvation from an imagined problem, but a real rescue from an impossible situation that I was in before God. So it's not made up. That's my first take home point today. And secondly, the events of Easter were no mistake. The crucifixion of Jesus, sad and terrible as it was, was no strange quirk of history. It's not as if God somehow slipped up and things got out of hand and Jesus went to his tragic end. So God had to figure out what to do next. His death had been planned from the beginning of time. As Jesus met with the disciples that first Easter day, he pointed out to them that everything that had happened leading up to the crucifixion was not only how he had told them it was going to be, but how the Old Testament had set out how things were going to be. Everything had to be fulfilled that the Old Testament had been pointing to, that it was necessary that the Messiah would suffer and then rise again. It was always going to be this way. For God had a plan to rescue mankind from sin and its consequent death. God didn't want people to die because of their rebellion, but rather that they turn and live. And so he did everything to make that possible. And what he made possible in Christ's death was that the penalty for our rebellion be paid for. And that if we turn from our rebellion to live for God, then we will live. Jesus' resurrection will be our resurrection. It was the only way for God to put things right between us. Yes, that all happened. Happened in accord with the prophecy of the Old Testament written hundreds of years before. And it's another reason for believing that this thing is not, not a myth. It fits the Old Testament prophecy in greater detail than many of us realize. So it's not made up. It's no mistake. And we have nowhere else to turn. What do I mean by that? We do have nowhere else to go for hope and help and a future. If it was proved beyond all doubt tomorrow that Jesus stayed dead, then you have to know there is no Christianity. There's no hope for the future. There's no justice for the end. There's no answers to life's questions. There's no promise of peace. There's no chance of change. There's no strength for living. Friends, if D Jesus didn't rise, it's all lost. Everything hangs on this. There was a time in Jesus' ministry when the things he'd been saying were just too hard for th some of those who were hearing to keep going. And they began to walk away. Jesus turns to the 12 who are closest and he says to them, you don't want to leave too, do you? And they said, where else have we to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. There is nowhere else to go. And I encourage you today to be confident in Jesus' resurrection. And in these very strange days in which we currently live, draw strength and comfort from Jesus' death and resurrection by which you have been forgiven and have eternal life. I want to ask you today, if the coronavirus comes to threaten your life, would you be absolutely clear and certain that you have eternal life, that you will spend eternity with God? Because Jesus died and rose again for you, you should be certain. You should be clear. Your sin has been paid for and Jesus has won victory over death. He opens the gate of everlasting life for you. So please be clear about Jesus' resurrection on this Easter day. It's not made up. No other explanation is feasible. It was no mistake. The events of Jesus' death and resurrection were no mistake but God's central plan to rescue us from the impact of our own rebellion against him. And there is nowhere else. There's nowhere else to turn but in Jesus. 
we have hope and life and peace and comfort and joy. Happy Easter. He is risen. Let's now come before God in prayer. Our great God who loves to hear us. Let us pray for the church and for the world.